Okay, we'll go. We've, we've, this is our last session and it's probably the, <laughs> the least prepared we are. You know, you get a bit blasé having done these things for ages. Um, anyway, let me start. As you all know, some of you will know, I'm James Rattray, Chairman of the Soldiers of Killiecrankie Group. We're a constituted group that focuses on our battlefield here at Killiecrankie. I'm telling the story of the Battle of Killiecrankie. This is the last of 10 sessions. I'm telling it using two books written by people who were here and they gave us good detailed accounts of the battle. Cameron, um, Cameron of Lochiel, um, Clan, of Chief, Clan Chief of, of Clan Cameron. Um, he gave us a very good side view from the Jacobite side and General Hugh Mackay who commanded the Scottish Government Army, the William and Mary Army, Lowland Army, um, and they, they both gave us very good views of the whole thing. <clears throat> In our journey to get to this last one, we learned who the two monarchs were, why they were both fighting to control Scotland, their two commanders, who they were, a lowlander com com commanding uh, the Highland regiments, the clan regiments, and a Highlander commanding the Lowland regiments, the William and, I, I, um, William and Mary's army. They raced the castle of Blair, why they, there was a race, the pass of Killiecrankie, the issues that they faced going through there. How Dundee very successfully chose the battlefield and manoeuvred the Scottish Government Army, Mackay's army, onto that battlefield in such a position that he couldn't do anything. He literally couldn't retreat, he couldn't attack. We talked about 1680s warfare and how different it was. One shot every minute, if you were lucky, with your musket with a wooden ramrod. He talked about the two battle, um, two battle lines from the two armies and the issues that both commanders faced. There was a pre-battle skirmish, the battle itself, which, and the decimation, the major loss of life. And then on Thursday, we went onto the battlefield with Lochiel and looked at the aftermath and the total, total wasted of life that took place there. Um, we also discussed briefly the A9 and some of the issues there, particularly the misinformation that was put forward to the public inquiry. In this tenth session, we're going to assess the implications through the eyes of the two, two first-hand accounts, Lochiel and Mackay, regarding the, the Jacobite victory. What did Scotland see of that? What were the issues? Where am I at the moment? Well, what I'd like to do to just show you this and we are in Scotland, um, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Inverness at the top and we're slap bang in the middle here and if you go go closer to the battlefield we are Blarathel's up here that was our first filming location second down here at the Pass of Killiecranky was down here visit National Trust Visitor Centre that a lot of you will know is there Soldiers Leap and then third was the flat field where those of you who come to our events will know this is the road that goes to Blair Athol. Um, that's where we were. Fourth and fifth was just below the A9 and you can see the A9 traveling through the heart of the battlefield there. Sixth was right up on the Jacobite clan lines. Seventh was the pre-skirmish event just between Mackay's regiment and here. Eighth the battle. We described the battle there. On Thursday we were, on Sunday, we were here um, looking at the dead going over the battlefield with Mackay and today we've come over the river and we are here literally um, here at the bottom we've got the river Gary going through here it runs from Blair Athol and we are on the opposite side Mackay would have crossed the river over here somewhere with his six to eight hundred soldiers after Arad's there, he would have looked at Arad as a defensive position and then crossed the river and marched off when he was defeated from here. <clears throat> In terms of the battle lines, you know, we, this is the government army, that was a Jacobite army, that's the river Gary along the bottom, that's the flat field at the bottom. We're looking here again, we're not on the battlefield, but we're looking across at the battlefield um, across the other side from here. So if I just point out to you, and I hope there's a bit of a slope here, right down the end there is Blair, Car Blair Athol and the Castle of Blair, 
um, you can see the hills coming across and let's as Kathleen pans around the hill opposite us it's probably probably the, the hill opposite us is the hill that the Jacobites came down the you can see the, the line of trees along the top there um, and just below that you can might just just above the tree line is roughly where the clan regiments would have stood um, <clears throat> along there the when we were in the, the with the Jacobite army I think it was session six we were in the shadow of those fir trees that you can see that on the, above the main tree line there which goes across the green grass that's where we stood the skirmish was just down below that where we stood for to describe the battle was just in the tree lines in in front of those houses you can see over in the distance there so that's literally where the battlefield is this flat area along the bottom here is where the baggage train came out of the pass the pass is around here we'll flip around to that in a minute but this is where the baggage train was and this is what everyone said um saved the total an annihilation of Mackay's army the 1200 horses and back um mules there on the on the field and that's the standing stone so let me just swing around a bit further you can see the hills and you can see from here why the pass of Killycrankie was so important you can see Ben Vraki at the top there that's the hill that's behind Pitlochry and the other hills and the pass is literally you can see the white houses in the bottom here and the pass of Killycrankie is through there and that's why all the armies coming up here to the castle of Blair and Blair Athol had to pass through that and to this day everything passes through there still the the roads the main A9 passes through there the railway line everything passes through the pass of Killycrankie so I'm going to turn around so that I'm not so hidden and if can Kathy pans this around um, this is a great amphitheater to watch the battle and what would have happened as my brother pointed out to me people would have come and watched the battle um, and this is a safe distance 250 yards your musket shot you'd have been out of range you would have watched what was happening it would have drawn people to the battlefield um, locals to see the spectacle uh, and obviously once the arm the battle had taken place more than likely they would have joined in there on the baggage train um, to collect whatever they could so the last session um, when camera Lockheel walked us over the battlefield and talked about the dead there and we'll start with Cameron Lockheel again and I'm sure I'll put this lovely bonnet on and he said after the battle the Highland army had more the air of shattered remains of a broken troop than conquerors for here it was literally true that the vanquished triumph and the victors mourned the death of their brave general and the loss of so many of their friends were inexhaustible fountains of grief and sorrow if you remember he said the Jacobites lost just over 600 one roughly a third of their number one in three of their friends and in the in the clan regiments were lost so there's no victory to celebrate and he continues he said the close the close last scene of this mournful tragedy of their lamented general and other gentlemen who fell with him and interred them in the church of Blair Athol I knew that Dundee was interred there and in fact if you go to the old church in old Blair um, you can see a plaque on the wall saying where Dundee was interred I didn't realize that other gentlemen clan leaders etc I'm assuming by this term gentlemen were buried there as well I never knew that Lochiel continues a real funeral solemnity there not being present one single person who did not participate in the general affliction so while it was a victory they had lost so much one in three lost so many of their friends and he just consider this the scene at that kirk in Blair Athol those of us who know it and if you think the army had 1,008 took just under 2,000 in the Highland army they lost just over 600 so about a thousand men or thereabouts gathered round that kirk 
um, as they buried General Mackay and some of the other gentlemen. So let's look at Scotland now. What did Lochiel say happened in Scotland because of the victory? He told us, but the greatest proof of the general consternation of all those William and Mary supporters was seized upon by the first news of Mackay's defeat. So once the defeat, everyone heard it, um, he'd been defeated. The Duke of Hamilton was a commissioner of the parliament, which then sat at Edinburgh, and the rest of the ministry were struck with panic. Some of them were retiring into England, others into the western shires of Scotland. They did not know whether to abandon the government or stay a few days until they saw what use my Lord Dundee would make of his victory. But the news of that great man Dundee's death quickly dissipated all their fears and their short-lived loyalty thereafter was changed into effective bigotry. So the death of Dundee changed everything. So what I'm going to do now is look at Mackay. What did he say? We know he retreated from the battlefield back to Stirling and Mackay tells us at, at Stirling the general was met by Major General Lanier whom the council, and this is the um, government of Scotland, had sent there to form a body of whatever forces there were in the south to maintain the river Forth and the pass of Stirling. And there's a saying in Scotland, he who holds Stirling controls the kingdom because any armies passing south from the highlands, from the north, had to pass, like Killiecrankie in a way, through Stirling. There was boggy land and everything else out to the west and the east there was the Firth of Forth where they couldn't cross. So, it, it continues, although all their thoughts and measures tended to abandon the northern countries of Scotland to the enemies, he, Mackay resolved, if he left the north, which is absolutely the best men of the kingdom for the war, to the discretion of the enemy, they would not get great numbers to join them, but also the possession of towns and seize the public revenues whereby they could form a fashion of government. So he, he believed if the um, William and Mary supporters let the North go over to the Jacobites, they would be able to form some fashion of a government. And Mackay was trying to hold things together. And we'll come back to um, Lochiel. And Lochiel was the um, oldest uh, um, officer general in the Highland Army and he talks about the Highland Army. He said General Cannon who was the oldest officer there took upon the command of that melancholy army the third day after the battle. And that was the same day of the rend rendezvous appointed by Lord Dundee. Dundee asked all the clans to get to Blair Athol on the 30th of July. The battle was on the 27th. So three days after the battle Cannon took charge and also what happened is all the clans arrived. They were joined by 500 of Lochiel's men conducted by his son John, 200 of the Stuarts of Appin and a party of MacGregors commanded by MacGregor of Roar, R-O-R-E, which 250 Macphersons as well as MacDougalls of the Braves of Loch Harbour and Glencoe. The whole men of Athol having marched the day before to Braemar there they were linked and joined by people of that country, the Farkasons, the Frasers, the Gordons of Strathdon and Glenlivet, so that the army amounted now to over 5,000 brave men. And that was three days after they buried Dundee. Um, and he continues, all parts of the kingdom were ready to join them and expected their advance with in, impatience. And it was gen generally computed that before they arrived at the borders of England, they would have 40,000 men to restore King James. And he continues, but as, so as soon as Dundee's death was generally known, the scene changed and all those mighty preparations and that universal spirit of Jacobitism vanished into nothing. Back to Mackay. Mackay tells us, he wrote to the Duke of Hamilton, that the Parliament should not be alarmed at what passed, but proceed in their affairs, 
while he, Mackay, would lose no time nor spare any pains to hinder the enemy from profiting by their victory. So Mackay's effort was now to try and, yes, the Jacobites had won, but he was going to um, get forces together to, to prevent them from benefiting from their victory. And he continues, having got his horse and dragoons to the parker of Stirling and passed them in review and leaving order with a new battalion of foot to follow him, he marched out of Stirling about two in the afternoon, taking his way straight to Perth, from whence he could not get news, as all the country between Stirling and Perth being in arms and most absent from their houses. So we know that Mackay is very quickly, within a day or two, got, an arm, get, got all the forces he could, um, and the, the cavalry that he longed for at the Battle of Killiecrankie that never arrived, he got them all together and he's marched off to Perth. Lochiel tells us the first thing that the new general, and that's Cannon, attempted miscarried for want of conduct. For having detached a party of strewn Robertsons, and this is uh, the area of the Robertsons where we're standing now, there were local men to Killiecrankie, and strewn is just up the road beyond uh, Blair Athol. Um, some of you will know the House of Brewer. Just up beyond that, a short distance is Struan. So for a detachment of Struan Robertsons and some from Braemar to go to Perth with orders to seize considerable quantity of meal and other provisions which the enemy had left behind. And you've got to remember, Ke General Cannon had to now feed 5,000 men. How do you do that? And Lochiel continued, they, the Struan Robertsons, loitered so long after they had been given their orders that Mackay had intelligence of their being in those parts and marched against them with a strong body of horse and dragoons, surprised and defeated them. And he continues, Mackay, Lochiel said, this showed that the Highlanders were not invincible as their late behaviour at the Battle of Killiecrankie made people fondly believe they were. And he, he goes on and tells us how things started to go badly for the Highlanders. He's, not only did they lose this first skirmish, um, and I talked to you throughout this story about the two armies reflecting the two cultures in Scotland at that time. And this little piece that Lochiel's going to come on to further illustrates that. Uh, but this time he's talking about the, the Highland Army, and in that Highland Army, yes, there were clan regiments, there were Gales, but also there were Lowlanders. And this is the incident he's talking about. Lochiel said, A council of war was held in the old castle of Ochendoon, where the first thing that fell under debate was whether low country officers who acted as volunteers without any command had the title to sit and vote. And as I say, you've got to remember the Lowlanders, if you think of the other armies, the uh, Lowland armies, they, they got ordinary people and tried to tr snare them into the regiments, almost as cannon fodder. Unlike the Highlanders, the Highlanders went in there with um, their cousins, their friends, as a clan, as a body, as a family. And he said the second thing that was there to be vote, devoted on was whether they should fight Mackay, whose strength consisted chiefly in horse, whether to fight him immediately, immediately, or should they, as commanded by King James, march to Kintyre and the West Shires in order to suppress them. Lochiel said he and, and the chiefs argued strenuously against the low, lowland officers having votes in their council, and he gave these reasons for this. First, they were unacquainted with the Highland discipline and customs. And this is exactly the point that I've tried to make all the way through this. Two different societies in Scotland, unacquainted by the Highland discipline and customs, and manners of fighting, which differed widely from what they were bred to among regular troops. And the second point they objected to was unreasonable for simp simple captains and subalterns who brought no strength of men to the army but their own person should have equal powers with those that actually had regiments or at least considered bodies of men. So that very clearly defines the two cultures here in Scotland. And that conflict 
was very clear there. Lochiel said, notwithstanding what was said by Lochiel, who had vigorously supported by the other chiefs, vigorously supported the motion, against the motion, the motion was carried at the Council of War. Not only did the lowland officers have a vote, but they also should march through Aberdeenshire without fighting the enemy. Lochiel said it was hard to assign any other reason for this ridiculous march except that of increasing their army by the conjunction of their northern friends. This retreat proved so fatal to their affairs that the army became dispirited and daily diminished. And Lochiel, seeing the king's orders neglected and that nothing was to be expected but fatigue from the march, from the ill-concerted measures retired to Lochaba in order to repose himself and they left the command of his men to his son. So that, well, Killy Cranky was a great victory. Unfortunately, they had, didn't have a commander and that was the end of the 1689 Jacobite Rising or war ended two and a half years later um, formally ended after the Glencoe massacre in February 1692. General Cannon had been sheltered and hidden in the Highlands and he was given safe conduct to France in March 1692 and that concluded that um, the Jacobite forces here. So what I'd like to do the, is just consider the what-ifs. The loss of Dundee was absolutely crucial to this whole campaign. You know, what if he'd heeded Lochiel's and the War Council, the Clan Chief's request that he didn't fight? And he, Dundee was determined to fight. But if he hadn't, the story may well have been different. The other thing that Lochiel told us is, if Sir William Wallace had not turned his Jacobite about and had followed Dundee into the, the battle, Dundee would not have had to stand up and make it and wave at them and make it clear to everyone that he was a commander which brought that shot on him. Uh, but life is full of what ifs. Dundee was the kingpin that the Jacobite um, James the Seventh Army had and losing him they had no other commander. So I'd like to just thank you all for following the story. I, there have been a number of, of real diehards amongst you who've been at every live session ever since it began and thank you very much. This whole experience of, of telling this story was that we obviously in coronavirus lockdown we live on the battlefield here and we can travel from one place to another within proximity of our home and I set myself a new task and that was to learn to live stream and you've been subjected to, to this learning experience. Um, there's been a considerable amount of effort to put this in. Well, there are, stu there are two books, but they're written in English of 330 years ago. I have read them several times before, but it's only with me having to trans sit down and, and work out what I was going to say and also put the two um, scripts next to each other so we're both talking about the same thing at the same time Did I get a more complete understanding. From a personal point of view, our Rattray family um, were Jacobites. My six times great-grandfather fought here. He was part of Dundee's cavalry. I like to think he was part of the 16 that followed Dundee. And there are accounts of him in the Gallic Society of Inverness records. And it talks about him having his basket, his, his sword smashed around his, his, his hand. And he had to leave the battlefield with the sword wrapped around his hand and going back to um, Strathardle and um, that direction, Blairgari direction, to his home. And the blacksmith eventually removed his hand from the sword. The Rattrays were involved in the Jacobite Wars all the way through. And last year at Leith, we unveiled a statue to John Rattray and his signature is under the oldest rules of golf. And there's a story there where golf saved him from the gallows and because his captain his friend wouldn't uh, wasn't prepared to see him being hung but so that's the rat trade connection 
after the Jacobite Risings, like so many Scots um, that went on to shape the British Empire, our family went out to India, had long connections with the Sikhs. And interestingly, Mackay's descendants also had connections with the Sikhs and, and a proud shared heritage with the Sikhs. And um, I find that interesting on both sides, how we have conflicts and then further down the line, our generations mixed together. There were disproportionately more Scots than any other nation in the UK that went to India, but that is a, a totally different story, of course. I'd like to thank my brothers who've helped behind the scenes. I'd like to thank Kathleen, who's standing behind the, the camera at the moment, being General Dog's body, camera man, lady, skivvy, everything else as you'd expect. Very supportive. Thank you, Kathleen. And next Tuesday, a week tonight, we're looking at a possibility of seeing if we can do a live streaming um, and we're going to talk about Montrose. A number of you have suggested that Montrose's influence on the Jacobite um, rising. We talk about the Highland Charge and also Dundee himself. He um, was well known. He, in fact, after his death, I'm told by my brother that he got the name Bloody Clavers. And we thought we might just talk about the two of those. So that's a week on Tuesday. So I'd just like to say thank you all for your support um, and good night.